Welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast for makerspace directors and I guess ex directors drink and talk about making stuff. Tonight I've got with me Aaron and Chris, and uh, tonight we're going to be talking about you know our usual uh, makers news things, but also uh, building communities and makerspaces, keeping them inclusive, and why that's super important to building your makerspace. So to start us out, though, Chris, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, I am drinking from one of our favorite breweries, the No Call No Show, uh, which is a really good, just really good beer. <laughs> but what brewery is it from? If it's industry. our favorite. Yes. Yeah. There you go. I just said industry, industry No Call No Show, didn't I? No, you said Maybe you I just know. said No Call No Show. It's uh, from it. Industry Brewing. Maybe I've already had a little bit too much. <laughs> yeah, Chris, Chris and I were on the heat break community hangout earlier and had already started drinking. So this might be a re-record episode. You never know. Aaron, what yeah. are you drinking? Some of us tried to join that call. Yeah, but yeah, you know. <laughs> we found out tonight that hangouts has a limit of 10. Uh, so we might end up finding a new way to do that. Um, in the future so more people can get on. Literally they, none of us knew that before we started, Aaron. It wasn't just to keep you out, but it was yeah. partially to but keep you out. But then it became out. that. <laughs> then it became its sole mission was to keep you out. <laughs> but of the doubt that it wasn't just to keep me out. <laughs> because it was limited to 10 people. It was Chrome only. Yeah, I, I realize Hangouts went Chrome only. Yeah, I don't know when that happened. Probably right yeah. around the time Google started trying to kill Hangouts. And that's yeah. I was honestly kind of surprised that it was on Hangouts because I was like, that's well, still running? I thought that was closing down as well. Yeah. So what well, are you drinking, Aaron? Help. I am drinking a Magical Unicorn Elixir. Oh, do they have it again? Yes, at, from Obed and Isaac's Microbrewery. They, it nice. was it, it was off tap when Chris and I went a couple weeks ago, and I was really sad because I wanted to get some. It is back, and it yeah. is great. Excellent. I am going there soon. I am drinking um, a beer that is a holdover from Rep Rat Fest, which is uh, the Muzzy Pale Ale from Goshen Brewing Company. Ah. found the crowler i forgot i had in my fridge tonight nice totally drinking that nice so with that aaron what's our first news topic tonight that one's yours joe oh i don't know anything <laughs> that's your about... link remember I don't know. I... Ah. all right so this smartwatch <laughs> it's uh, i already call on hack day and um this thing is just gorgeous uh it's a scratch built uh smartwatch I forgot the guy's name. Uh, uh, Samson March. There you go. That guy built this beautiful smartwatch. Um, it looks like it's got a wood case and a really nice LCD display. Turns out he's an electrical engineer in his like real life. So and a product designer. Yeah, like so... the two things you want in a project like this. <laughs> yeah, this thing is beautiful though. It looks like a finished product and. It's open source. The files are available on GitHub. I mean, that's just exciting. Yeah. No, it's really cool. Like I, when this first popped up in our chat, I honest to God thought that the the like photo that was on kind of the article looked like a Samsung kind of display photo. Um, like it looks like super well done. Um, so some of the other kind of DIY um startup smart watches have kind of been like a little bit hit or miss especially when they come to 3d printed cases but like this thing i would absolutely consider wearing it looks it looks awesome wow and there's a project going right now to make pcbs both bare pcbs and soldered pcbs available and that's awesome, awesome. like it's a current conversation uh, there's activity all the way up until today that's i remember rad. we covered uh the Electro Noob PCB smartwatch a couple months back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this blows that out of the water. Oh, yeah. Because you got like a, a proper uh, LCD screen, uh, Look, Bluetooth connectivity. The Electro Noob thing was super cool, uh, but, you know, it looked like something that you built at your desk. This thing looks like a product. Like, right. He really did a good job. He gets a golf clap from me. 
It's excellent. Oh, yeah, and the case is wood-filled PLA. Even better. So the next news topic, kind of hackery. Um, definitely more for the IT-oriented listeners. But uh, a, cu- a couple of... Uh, what are these guys, students? They are... If you're familiar at all with computer vision, uh, it uses generally uses some sort of machine learning algorithm, uh, generally some sort of neural network that will determine an object based on general set of criteria that it the, the network itself determines. But these two guys have found an algorithm to trick a convolutional neural network that would normally detect you as a, a human being to just completely ignore you by introducing just a little bit of noise via a specially crafted photo. So in the example, they've got two guys uh, standing there by some lockers. One guy is being correctly identified as a person, but the second person is standing there with a hoodie, and he's got like a photo of like some umbrellas and some people, and he's not being detected because he's introduced enough amount of noise to trick the algorithm. And I just thought this was super awesome because I've personally just been thinking in the back of my head how in, 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 a, in a world where we're starting to see more mass surveillance and more, you know, AI-driven computer vision type stuff, how would you, as a normal person, want to defeat that? And this never crossed my mind. No. And this is just awesome. So it it's a really, really neat proof of concept. But the, the article that was initially put out that I saw, which was different than the Hackaday article that we're linking to, uh, was very misleading in how the writers wrote about it. Um, because the the image that they're using as camouflage, it only tricks one algorithm, um, of which there are many. And it's very specific on the placement of the picture on the person and the angle at which it is to the camera. Right. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's not a cloak of invisibility yet. But it is a cloak it's, of it's, it's almost more of a semi. shield. Yeah, it's like a. It's you have a to hold it in a certain way. That's a really good analogy. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> good job. <laughs> There's a YouTube video on the Hackaday page, which they actually demonstrate it, and you can see uh, as they hold the picture, and they kind of sl- they start to rotate it, and then they almost immediately are detected. Yeah. But yeah, and then the uh, the last article that we have. Um, is gimmicky and hilarious, and that is why I love it. KeyCAD now has a banana that you can import for scale. And love it. That, like, love it it's, so much. It's hilarious, but man, is it needed. Because, <laughs> um, so in my years of working on CAD, I can think of two very specific stories where I worked on something in CAD and, you know, got used to the scale on the screen, which makes no sense because like you can zoom in or you can zoom out. And um, in one instance, something was incredibly tiny. And in one instance, something was so big, I had trouble comprehending what I did. (laughs) (laughs) But there was this one thing that I had to, had to machine. It was the small thing. And, you know, I knew it was small because the end mill that I was machining it with was a half millimeter end mill. And uh, the the feature that I was machining was like barely touching it with a half millimeter end mill. But in your head, it's hard to wrap your head around a half millimeter diameter end mill to cut something. And also what you're cutting with that half millimeter end mill. And when I finally saw what I was cutting... When the the machine just brought it to me uh, after I wrote the program. I was just like, it it did something. <laughs> I could barely see it. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, this is exactly what we needed. You did a great job. It's like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> and uh, the other thing was just this massive tractor part that we were welding uh, with a robot welder, and uh, I got out to see the tractor part, and I was like, oh, I understand now why we didn't want to flip that over so many times. <laughs> Because it was like 30 feet long. You know, on the screen, it's like this big. Right. This big. Yeah. <laughs> no, scale is super hard to uh, get in CAD. Yes. To grasp. When yeah. I was doing the laser bed project, it's all based on 15 millimeter extrusion and M3 screws. Yeah. And in the design, I'm like, oh, this is no big deal. You know, this is fine. And then I print the things and then I get the parts in. I'm like, Holy fuck, these screws are tiny. <laughs> these are tiny-ass screws. 
Well, that was um, when we did the uh, drift track project at the Makerspace a couple of years ago. When I was initially trying to figure out the frame dimensions, I was like, yeah, this frame looks good. Like this, this many inches and this angle. And then uh, one of our friends, Tim, was looking at the frame and he's like, you think that's going to work? Like we should mock that up or something, like do something to make it give it some real sense of scale. And I found a uh, a human model on um, GrabCAD that had all of the joints uh, separated so that I could bring it into fusion and give it opposable joints like a human. And I, I shaped him into the uh, drift trike. And sure enough, Tim was right. That frame, <laughs> my knees would have been in my chest and I, you know, it, it would worked well. And then you know, when we built Christian's trike, we did the same thing. We just scaled it up to Christian size and then, um, stuck it on and was like oh yeah so we need to stretch the frame here and do this and it, it made it really nice so yeah banana for scale good job keycad so i have one more shout out sure this came right out of the keycon conference that was last weekend but there's a github repo for a set of keycad tools in order to in order to integrate your keycad project with git so that will give you uh, Git differences between your revisions of your PCB. So you can source control your PCB and your KiCad program or your project. Are they doing that on at like the binary level? Or are, are, because it breaking into the... Uh, I doubt it's at the binary level because that wouldn't make human sense. I haven't looked into it that much, honestly. I just wanted to give a shout out because uh, Drew Fustini tweeted it last week. Yeah. And I thought that was awesome. When anything can be source controlled, it makes it better. That's, I, I know, I, yeah, it's an inside joke at this point with the show, but <laughs> it does make it better because now you can see when the design changes and maybe you, and maybe you introduce uh, an electrical bug in the schematic. You can then trace it back to when it was changed and then, you know, go back to the revision where it wasn't broken. When we were using uh, Git to source control FreeCAD files, the, the biggest problem was you could never tell what the changes were because it was always con doing a diff on a binary. So basically all you'd get is a file size difference and like the save right. time. I think so it's more, the... more of the implementation of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, we'll put a link in the description for that. All right. So... On to the topic. Real quick, we like burned through the news. We're never through the news this fast. Honestly, we are normally through the news this fast. Are we? If you look at the show notes of most episodes, we're usually done around the 15 minute mark. Oh, okay. I, I, <laughs> I, I thought it was usually around the 30 minute mark. I was going to oh, see no. if you guys wanted to give any project updates. We could. I have some. Do it. Just today. I got in the mail the new Precision Piezo PCB sensor. Oh, uh, yeah. For my printer bot hardware kit. Nice. So, um, for those who aren't aware, me and Joe got one of the printer bot Simple Pro hardware kits from the printer bot liquidation on Twitter. Sad news, but good news for us, sort of. <laughs> yeah. Overall, a slightly net positive news. Yes. <laughs> but we, we got kits of just the hardware, so just the sheet metal, uh, aluminum parts, and the linear rails. But no electronics, no hot ends, no motors. So it's up to us to assemble the printer. And I am taking it and making it the beefiest, most mobile 3D printer I can make. So it's, it's going to have a, a Duet Wi-Fi uh, controller board on it. We're going to have an E3D tight narrow hot end. And then we're going to have this precision piezo probe sensor on it, which will replace the induction sensor that was originally on it. That requires the hot end assembly to flex upwards. So when it would normally probe, it will have the nozzle slightly touch the bed. It will flex the entire assembly upwards and the piezo sensor is a little ceramic disc, and as it flexes, it will change its resistance, and the board will 
detect that change in resistance, and then it will amplify it so it becomes more of a micro switch to the, to the controller. So it becomes more of an on-off switch. And there's little pots on the circuit board that you can, you know, tweak to make it work well. But got that in today. That took a good two weeks to get in. Uh, I need to figure out where I want to mount that and get that added into my uh, model. Uh, last week's discussion on that sheet metal mount is what I'm going to be working on soon is to get that going. Sweet. Nice. Yeah. I haven't decided what I'm going to do with mine yet. I, I've debated on doing 100% Chinese clones to make it the most ironic printer possible. <laughs> and then I've debated on um, making it the most ludicrous printer possible and putting like a giant hot end on this printer with this tiny volume. Uh, also for funsies, I, I haven't decided yet. I, I'm looking at like all of my parts next to me and I'm like, what do you want to do, Joe? Uh, <laughs> I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So printer bots weren't open source when they were available, right? Uh, yeah. Most of the printer bot projects were open source to an extent. They were never easy to find. Uh, but you could find them and you could get to them uh, once they were done. I don't think he ever open sourced the Simple Pro. So were the files available or were they actually licensed, opened? Were they just source available? I don't remember. I think they were source available. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so so my my approach to this is make it as open as it can be. So I like Titan the... Arrow, which is GPL and Duet Wi-Fi, which is open hardware, open source, and the P Precision Piezo, which is open hardware, open source. I like that you're putting a $200 controller on this tiny printer. That makes me happy. That, oh, I like it too. That that satisfies my see sense of ridiculousness. Well, it's either that or be because you get the Wi-Fi control on it. It's either that or I get a requires some sort of display on the front and then custom get the display to, to you know mount uh, that'd be a whole uh, other thing i don't know i i'm debating on something that takes marlin 2 or um some other weird firmware like redeem or something like that just to dive down another rabbit hole you or make it right. super simple so my kid can use it that could that could be too you know, you keep saying you need to learn Python, Joe. You should just write your own printer oh. software. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even... It's Think not... of the resume cred you could get. That's no. <laughs> <laughs> In three years, think of the resume cred. <laughs> no. No, I'm not down for that at all. Um, Chris, you got anything you want to update on? Uh, as of right now, mm, I am getting ready to uh, hopefully do one of the videos uh, this week is is my biggest one. So um, I'm meeting with the one of the guys that I'm going to be interviewing tomorrow, and we're going to be kind of talking over stuff to get him prepped. And then uh, hopefully I'll be shooting a video this week. For those of you that don't know, Chris is diving back into his video creation roots. Not oh. with the Makers on Tap podcast crew, but with a whole different creative crew. Um, and you know, maybe at some point we will have them on Makers on Tap to talk about some of the work that they've been doing. Um, I've been bugging them for a while. We'll see. It might happen. It'd be they right. are definitely a more visual crew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and yeah, and then I am so this week I have put my mill back together, my my large mill, because Aaron has my baby mill now. And I have I, I got home from the makerspace Thursday night and I made the mistake of drinking a Red Bull at 1130 at night. <laughs> and I got home and I was like, I have so much energy, but my brain's so sleepy. So if I go like try to draw or try to program something, I'll just like scroll down the Facebook vortex of doom. So I went to the garage and I was like, what needs to be done? And then I reassembled a mill. I have to make one motor mount. Like because, you do. Yeah. Like you do. <laughs> Somehow my motor mount distance changed 
in in my reassembly. I think I forgot a spacer somewhere, but my motor mounts were never good anyway, and I'm much better at making things than I was four years ago when I started this mill CNC conversion. So new motor mounts are coming tomorrow, maybe. And yeah, and I, I have a huge project on the horizon that I'm not going to talk about because I, I might not. Like, something's going to happen that's going to get in the way like it has for the last five years. So, But maybe it Maybe once once things start getting cut for it, I will talk about it. I'm so excited. That is, is it so what I cryptic. think it is. Ginormous dual two two gan two. Oh, gans. that thing! Yeah, that thing. That ah. thing is interesting. What do you okay. What are you doing over there, Chris? Oh, I thought I thought we, you said he's doing it the was anime that thing like me. <laughs> I was doing this. Was doing like. <laughs> Chris, Chris, Chris is over there, like arm dancing. And I'm like, what? What are you? What are you trying to convey to me, buddy? <laughs> what did you call me, boy? <laughs> oh God! All right, so on to our topic: um, building communities at maker spaces. So whenever I talk to people about maker spaces for the first time, like if I'm giving a talk on maker spaces, or if I, I'm going to like try to pitch a maker space to a team or something. I always ask like the room, like, what do you guys think of maker spaces? Somebody tell me what a maker space is. And it never fails. Somebody in the room is like, it, it's a, it's a place with a bunch of tools where I can create. And that's not wrong, but a maker space is far more than a sum of its tools. It's a sum of its people, right? Oh, Any sweet. regular Jack off can, to fill a room with machines. Exactly. But nobody's going to care that you've got a bunch of cool machines if there's nobody there. And this was a, like, even when I, when I got the people together initially to start River City Labs, I never, I didn't, I didn't understand at the time what the community would mean. I just figured it'd be a bunch of people avoiding talking to each other and trying to get some stuff done. And then we spent four years not having any functional machines <laughs> and building a really incredible community. And uh, yeah. it really changed what I thought a makerspace was. And then I started going around talking to other people that had a makerspace because, you know, I did what every good person that starts a business should do, which is not visit any other business that is similar to it and not do any research at all and just dive headfirst into it. That's what, I, that's what we did. And, um, and then later go research it. Cause that's, that's what all good entrepreneurs do. Right. I mean, yeah, right. No, that's, you got it down there. <laughs> I am so impressed. We've gotten as far as we have with the track record we have of working machines. There's there's a solid part of me that thinks some of our success has been because we don't we didn't have working machines because <laughs> there's no other way to explain it. <laughs> I 100 percent agree with both of you. <laughs> um, yeah, there there was a time. I don't feel this way now, but there was a time where um, I openly told people when they when somebody would come to us and be like, "How much money do you guys need to like?" to do some great things like if i was to oh, help he asked you me get that it... this wednesday yeah good at the innovation alliance she's like what what's your biggest challenge and i'm like well i could say money but that's like every nonprofit. yeah really it's just people we need people motivated for the cause yeah is, is our biggest challenge but go ahead but um you know people would always come up to us and be like how much money do you guys need what what do you what kind of money would you guys need to do something great? And uh uh my my numbers were always very small, like in the couple thousand dollar range. And uh it was because we built a really great community because we were scrappy. Uh, we needed the people to um to want to contribute their time. Uh, not not because they were getting paid, but because they wanted to contribute to the cause. We we needed that uh, that hunger that not having resources drives you to to build that really great community. And 
I always told people that like if somebody came up to us and offered us a grant of like twenty five thousand dollars or just wanted to write us a check for like twenty five thousand dollars, I would have flat out told them no. Because the amount of an amount of money like that would completely change the organization from this inclusive um, community to a cash grab. Like as soon as you've right. got money, people now their goals change. Yeah. Either they want that money from you or they want you to spend that money on things that are their goals. And that's it. like what kind of gets frustrating is like when money gets introduced the whole dynamic changes. Yes. Where it's like, well, shit, now we got to take this a lot more serious. And now we got to actually put these people in charge of this. And now we got to have deadlines. Now that like the nice thing that I think a lot of us have all liked about the space that we have is a lot of it is what it is because it's been people that are passionate about what they're doing there. Yeah. There is no like none of us make money. None of us like go into it to necessarily even get a particular goal. It's always been we love what we do and that's why we do it. Well, it's like think about um think about when we needed a laser cutter. You know, mm-hmm. it, it wasn't like all right, you know, this year we're going to have a budget of $50,000 to build tools. And we need to earmark four thousand dollars for a laser cutter, and then we need a committee to vote on that. We need to do this, and we need to do that. It was all right. We need a laser cutter, and to get that laser cutter, we need between two and four thousand dollars. How are we going to raise that much money? And you know, then we would go to the community and say, like, all right, these are our options for a laser cutter, and they cost X and dollars and X dollars and X dollars. Uh, what do you guys think? And, you know, the community would vote on it, and, and they voted that we should build a laser cutter. And we said, okay, for to build that laser cutter, I think we need to get this gantry and this laser tube and this laser power supply, and it's going to cost this much money. Um, how should we go about that? And then... You know, the community was like, oh, well, you know, I'll throw in a hundred bucks. I'll throw in 50 bucks. I'll throw in $20. I got 10. And then next thing we knew, we had a budget for a laser cutter. And it was built off of the community instead of being built off of a grant. And because of that, everyone felt like they had ownership of it. And I do feel bad um, in the sense of that because it took us a long time to build the laser. Um, Right. So, sorry, guys. It took us a long time. But it works really well now. And it yeah. turned out really awesome. Um, you know, my life changed considerably at, right after we made the commitment to do the laser cutter. Like, my life was like, oh, I can't do this anymore. I'm yeah. sorry. Which is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. why I, I don't commit to things that. at the makerspace <laughs> anymore. Go on ahead, Aaron. <laughs> so, if somebody offered us, like, $25,000... I probably would accept it, but I would have limitations on how we spend it. It would have to be spent on things that aren't reoccurring, right? So we couldn't just immediately expand the space we're in because that's not sustainable because we can't guarantee we get more of this money. So like what I would do is I would, you know, I would replace a lot of the machines that we have on indefinite loan with our own machines. So like we have a couple printers, for instance, that are on loan. I would just replace with things that the space owns. And now we control them, and now we say, well... So, for instance, we're standardizing on Lulzbot printers, but we have a Lulzbot printer that has a custom Titan Arrow, and now we have uh, one of Joe's i4 designs, which is kind of based on Lulzbot printers, but let's, let's just say we replace that with another TAS. Now we just have all three TASs. Now it standardizes, and that's fine. And, and we were gonna, and whenever somebody in, loans uh, equipment to us, we maintain it like as if it were our own. But now it is. So, um, for instance, we have a router on loan that may or may not leave at the end of the year. Um, if we had that money, I would just go ahead and start. machine that we fully own as a space. We would still put that money forward to maintain the the tool that was on loan but now we own the machine as a space and we'll just put that money toward the machine that we own i think there are there are avenues where you could spend that money 
in one time purchases that could incur more like financial debt and responsibility to the space over time. But I the, think you at the I think, same I think time though, it's not your decision to make. As a as a makerspace president, you still have to bring that to a vote. For sure, yeah. And when somebody sees a five digit number of money, their expectations change. You know, that conversation might change from, well, you know, we shouldn't replace those machines because those are on indefinite loan. We should take that money and we should buy this machine for this project that I want to do. And then you know, they're rallying in the maker space to get that machine for their little clique of people that are excited about that area. Say, if we're going to get it, they want to get a uh, Tormach mill, you know, which is totally doable with $25,000, but it would take, completely take away the budget that you had for uh, replacing the indefinite loan machines. It would be gone. You know? Sure. So, yeah. So and that's that, totally fine. And then when you don't do that, then they they create like an off cast where you know, they've got these angsty people in the makerspace now because they didn't get your mill or you didn't get their mill and you did your thing and you're now the dictator. Like money just breeds this this frustration and this angst in the organization. And we've never had that because we've never had money. <laughs> Right. Well, that was something that I kind of wanted to ask you. So how how do you feel that you you actually breeded the community that we have now? Because like, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my story coming into the space was, um, I said it before on the show, uh, I was introduced to the space by my professor uh, when I was going to a community college, um, got in on a 3D printer build, and then started attending space nights um not long after that pretty much to get support for the printer that i was a part of um but uh, over time and over just like slowly getting introduced i was kind of welcomed into the group um but i will say one of the things that we've we've been criticized for a little bit um, and we've also heard other spaces criticized about is the kind of clickish nature that does happen within a space. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is if you had to do it all over again, Joe being one of the founding members of RCL, how would you try and change that community to be more welcoming? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I heard the question as you were asking it and I was like, I don't. Um, clicks are hard, um, especially in a community full of like-minded individuals with strong opinions, clicks form easily and quickly, and, um, they can be really poisonous to your culture. Uh, we've been lucky in the sense that, uh, we have a fairly small amount of members in terms of, um, some of the maker spaces that I uh, am in contact with or just like around like we as a maker space, we, we tend to hover around the 60 member mark. And uh, yeah, there's a number of maker spaces that we are, have relationships with that hover around the 400 member mark. And the, the click generation that happens in the difference between those two numbers is really severe, but um if we did it different uh I think th I think the main things that we I would try to do different is um push harder for a more accessible location earlier uh we spent the first year and a half to two years we spent living in a storage closet in an art gallery, essentially we had 400 square feet um, and none of our tools worked. No, none of them. Uh, we had two 3d printers. Those worked. Uh, but we had a lot of tools that just never worked. And then we moved to a, a space that uh, was about 1200 square feet, uh, but it was up a very steep flight of like 20 stairs and that space was fun. 
uh, there was a good year that I can't believe we had members because they there was a portion of the winter where there was three walls. Uh, and the one wall was a tarp from floor to ceiling. And the only way to do anything in a space was to be there with a winter jacket. And that was a rough winter. Um, we had the, the, we had like what three kerosene heaters going at pretty much all times. Anybody was there. Yeah. It was just so like, cause it, it, I remember doing it. We would have to go get kerosene before we went to the space to fill up the heaters. Yeah. But like at the same time, I think those years shaped our culture. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of like having a rough childhood and being like, I wish I could do it all over again. But at the same time, it like made you who you were. It, it molds no, you like it molds yeah. you like it. Yeah. Those years sucked, but they also, they really weeded out the people that wanted it. And that's how we have such a strong community now is because the people that wanted it are still here. And the people that didn't came, they may have left and some of them came back. Um, and you know, some of them joined the space and got a taste of what it could be to have a CNC machine, like a personal CNC machine and like got excited about projects and then bought their own machines and have their own workshops at home now. Uh, but they are still in contact with the space through like Slack and still support us through memberships, but just never come. Um, and I think those people are great too. Um, I don't know. Uh, the for what you asked though, like dealing with clicks, especially as an officer, I think it's very important for you to pay attention to your community, um, to take a step back as an outsider and not participate in the conversations of the night, not participate in the group builds of the night. And just take a step back and watch the dynamic of the space and see how new people are treated. And you know, if if they're getting the cold shoulder, which is super common in a maker space, to make sure that you're the one that steps out, even if you don't want to. It As an officer, it's your job to make sure that new people are at least said hi to. It, that is the first step. It, at least walk up to the new people that walk in that are hanging out in the corner that are nervous as hell because they're in this group of experts in this new space that they don't understand and just say hi to them and make sure that they know that they've been seen. And um, if they do have any questions, you are the friendly face to say hi to them. Um, and you know, if you do see clicks starting to form, It's hard because clicks form from friends. So I don't want to be like, oh, you should break those up. But you should make sure that um, people are still included in those groups because they might form around like the woodworkers or like the machine shop guys. And they, you might get little mini feuds in the space. Um and it's it's important to diffuse those things as quickly as possible because those are the things that can turn into really big space conflicts. Um, and those are the conversations that I see a lot in like the Nation of Makers forums. Like, how do I deal with you know this this uh, this one member that you know, he feels like our, the wood shop is his, and anytime somebody moves a plane, he gets really upset. Like, how do I deal with that guy? how I deal with that group. Like those are the conversations that we see a lot in um, the groups where it's multiple makerspace organizers. Um, and, and the, the only way is really just to catch it early and to just make sure people understand their place in the space and that the space is everybody's. I don't know. I didn't, I don't know if I answered your question. No, fair enough. I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> it's been so long. <laughs> I essentially like I, what I wanted to come of it was either if you're building a community, how do you build a community that oh, is gosh. inclusive? Or if you're like trying to get into a community, how do you put yourself out there to feel like you, you can actually integrate with the group? Um, so for the most part, yeah. When we started the space, um, this is one thing I will say 
is we were initially very selective on who we invited to public nights. Um, and not just to like keep it a secret or to keep it exclusive, but uh, to make sure that the space wasn't overwhelmed with new people and to make sure that the initial group of people that we were inviting um, would just fit in with the rest of the group uh, so that we didn't have conflicts early. Like every week I would make it a point to invite at least one person that I knew would fit in with the dynamic, even if it was a new person that I just met or somebody that I knew. Uh, and everybody tried to do something similar to that. But we were, we kind of curated the early membership uh, to work well, if that makes sense. And now I just invite anybody. It's like, come to the space on a Thursday. You know, come hang out and, and talk. Because we've got enough people now that somebody's going to find somebody they get along with. Well, and it's, we built that core up over so long that like, yeah. it is stable enough now. Like, if we lose or don't gain members at this point, the space is still going to be fine. But You could also argue that we built a core up of a certain bias. Yes. Definitely. And now it's hard to bring in other people, you know, opposing of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's that's crucial, too. I, I think that is one thing that I would do different is early on um, invite more diversity. And like, that's a hard argument because it, you can say, how that, do you know, like, uh, that's kind of the whole point is like, how do you know your own? Bodies? Yeah. And like. My wife yells at me all the time. She's like, your makerspace is made up of a bunch of like mid thirties <laughs> white dudes. You need, yeah. you need more minorities yeah. in the space and you need more women in the space. And I'm like, that's awesome. But at the same time, I don't know any women or minorities that are into the things I'm into. And it's hard yeah. for me to branch that out. Um, that, that's been one of my goals for this year. And you know, we've is... done things like WTF night was fun yeah. and it didn't work um and maybe it worked it didn't work it kind of fell so on its face. i, I no, think it's a I'm great gonna... idea and I, <laughs> you see i think we need somebody more engaged to yeah. lead it yes it's not so... that it, it's not that it didn't work it's just that we need somebody more engaged to lead it i am gonna say we are doing something that is very smart that i feel like should have been done a little bit ago um but building up the code of conduct now should have been done a little bit ago. Yeah. And we we should have, but we just didn't even think about it. So I'm glad that you're building that up now. Yep. You. Because there is certain cultures that can, not cultures, there are certain traits that people can exhibit um, that need to be called out. Yeah. And without oh. having a specific rule set outlined that you can point to, and it's not like, hey, you're being a dick. Right. It's like, no, hey, you're violating the rules. Like, you need to check yourself now, because if you don't, we're going to have to ask you to leave. Yeah. Right. And like, because unfortunately, it is not unfortunately, we have a, we have a lot of an excellent members. We really do. But at the same time, the makerspace lends itself to an older white crowd. A lot of machinists, a lot of just like older white guys. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of that culture from older days. We have can all still the sip into that. Yep. And so like it can become unwelcoming. And so if, if I'm going to say any of my advice is. Watch that stuff yeah. and make sure that you create something like a code of conduct that can help you when you need to call that shit out. Yep. Because most likely you're going to have it because you're catering to that crowd. And if you want to get a diverse crowd and you got to have stuff that's going to make them feel like they're welcome. Yep. And the other thing I would say, if you're trying to build a community is, um, what helped us initially was always having a weekly free night where people are going to be there and people are expecting 
to give tours and expecting to welcome new members and expecting to do you know, all of those things. And to be honest, that's something I'm seeing die at River City Labs right now is like Thursday nights are are not what they used to be. And I'm not sure how yeah. to fix that. Um, but like it's it's really, really important as we're trying to grow our space and as you're trying to grow your space that um, there is a known night that there is going to be at least a few people there that are expecting to give tours and not expecting to work on projects. Um, mm. The way I know a couple spaces do it is they have an assigned time. Um, you know, you show up at like 630 on a Tuesday and they everyone signs waivers. There's like a little presentation on what the space is and tours are given. And then after that, people are allowed to mill around and, and like discuss. But like there's like a set schedule of events. And I've gone to a couple of those at different spaces and I really enjoyed them. They were super fun. Um but it's uh I think that's a really important thing as you're trying to build your community is to make sure that uh there is like a known time because trying to nail people down to give tours and to be available it's it's hard and it's not as much fun to show up to a space with like one person that's like ready to give you this nickel tour real quick and then get out like it's yeah. it's a lot more fun to to show up when there's a community there or like somebody maybe is working on something but is also expecting to be friendly um and, and that's we had that for a long time and uh you know it could be like the seasons or whatever but I'm, it's dying at the space right now and it's frustrating um and i'm part of it dying I, i'm not near as welcoming but it's not my job anymore i, I did it for a long time and I passed the torch this year. I'm not a director anymore. Um, but I, I still want to do my part, but really deep yeah. into this crawler getting real talky. It's definitely a, a tough situation. After this chat is, is definitely quieter this year than it was last year. And, <laughs> and Thursday nights have been a lot lighter than they have been pre in previous years. And, who knows if that's due to the location since we moved last fall. I've been checking like our Slack. Um, there's an analytics page that you can check and you kind of compare it to months and years past. And I know it seems like people aren't as active now, but it seems that that's a, an annual thing. If you look at our, our Slack usage of, from 2018 in the same year, we're about on track for there's a dip after February and March and April, as the weather gets nice and people are outside more, they don't come to the space as much. So I'm not entirely concerned about that. One thing I do want to work on more this year is the WTF nights, which is the Women Trans and Femmes nights. Is It's a fantastic idea, and even our first night in the second time we had it, we had a great turnout at the space from what I heard. We had people come in that I've that would never have came in before. And that's kind of the whole point of it, is that while we say we have an open night on every Thursday, people still don't show up because they're, they're nervous and they're scared because of the intimidation. Yeah. And that's what we want to eliminate, you know. But the thing is, the people that we had, you know, that, that had said they could lead it, you know, got busy. So they couldn't lead it as well as they wanted to. So that's another key point of the community building is making sure a that the people you're picking to build your community are truly committed because it's really easy to say something like say yes to something but it's really hard to follow through with it. And yeah. if if they're not committed that you're committed to backfilling for them. And like one of the things that I have had trouble with over the years is like I'll get really excited about something. Um, quad racing is a really good example. Uh, I got really into quad racing for about a year and a half and I was building them and like all this stuff. And um, I met a friend and he was super into it too. And he really wanted to build a community. Like he set up a, um, 
an open RC chapter in the area and, and everything. And I was like, awesome. If you're going to do that stuff, you should handle the quad racing organization. And here's all the contacts I've set up for like racing locations. And here's all this stuff. And you should do that. And like he committed to it, but I could tell he was kind of um, tentative. And then it just kind of disappeared. And it, what it turned out was he was excited about it. He was really excited about it. And then when it like, got down to like dealing with all the people, he wasn't so excited about it anymore. Um, he, he wasn't me who like, like building the communities and meeting the people and like setting up the organization and everything like excited him. He wasn't that he just wanted to race quads with his friends. Um, and it, it kind of fell on its face because you know, it wasn't it wasn't that. So it's really, I think WTF night kind of was the same deal. Like you and I were, Aaron were really excited about it. We were really gung ho about it. And the person that we picked to lead it, thought it was a great idea um but isn't so much of that community builder type that like wants to organize it and wants to lead it and wants to recruit people to it it's really those people are hard to find but it's also really hard to find people that are as passionate about your ideas as you are yeah and like this is this is the same thing that we try to preach to people that come to the makerspace that want other people to like make their product or idea for them is like good you can ask around but good luck finding somebody that's going to be as excited as you are about your world changing product it, yeah. it's just not going to happen it might but it's probably not it's definitely a chicken and egg scenario right it is yeah would it be weird if i ran it i as a white dude yeah totally yeah. it totally would um I, because I, I would do it i know right i'm the that's same all way it took. It, but it, but like so wtf night was women trans and fem night for those two are uninitiated so that's why it would be I said weird that earlier did you okay i don't yeah it could have been slurred like i said deep into the crawler um <laughs> but you know for that's why it would be weird for one of the two white dudes to go lead it is yeah like I I have a an awful full beard to be a femme dude, um, it just wouldn't work well. But I, but at the same time, I'm I'm all about it. So I really want it to happen, and we just haven't found the right person to lead it. And the right person is hard to find, you know. Well, and especially for something like such a project that's so focused on a specific set of people, yes, and it's not as open ended. Yes. And so we're basically being like, hey, we know that you love the space. We want you to love this very specific part of the space. And we want you to lead that. Yes. And that's what's hard is like finding people who are okay with being so focused in on this and going in headlong in order to reach these more people. Whereas what we're finding is a lot of the people that we think are like that very much just want to hang out at the space. And that's yep. totally cool. But we need to find this person who can help us do these certain things. And that's just hard because it's a, it, it, it's a huge undertaking. Yeah. It really is. Um, to Community lead a builders specific are hard to project. find. What's up? Community builders are hard to find. Yeah. And yeah, when you, you do are essentially building another community within the space. Yeah. And when you do find them, they're already passionate about their own thing. So good luck getting them redirected onto your thing. <laughs> yeah. It it's really why, is. It's why I haven't handed over MakerFest to somebody else. Because I don't, I, I haven't found somebody else that wants to take it over. Yeah, no one gives a shit about that. Yep. By the way, Midwest MakerFest. Uh, yeah. Registration is open for Midwest MakerFest. Ignite 2019 is on August 10th. It's the largest maker fest in the Midwest, I think. I need to actually yeah, check those numbers, but we have a lot. And when I we we are, yeah we are we're the biggest uh, license free maker fest. We definitely are by far. Yes. Uh, but I I am I am ninety percent positive that we are bigger than most of the maker fairs in the Chicago land area. I would believe that. So in yeah. Peoria, so. You know, come come visit. 
Makers on Tap and Midwest Maker Fest 2019. Well, you guys got anything more that you wanna you wanna hash out? Hours. Hours. I am ready to talk forever. Yeah. Seriously. Stuff. If anyone ever wants to talk about makerspace building and community building hours. And I won't even like talk to you about classes and programming and stuff because I don't I don't care about that. But it, I will talk to you for hours about building. Yeah, you can community. tell because of our lack of programming and classes, right? Yeah, it's not that I don't <laughs> care about it. It's just I haven't got that. There's far people yet. who can do it better, and that's like we want them to be in charge of it. <laughs> we just can't do classes. <laughs> I did. I did a whole. I taught a college level CAD course at River City Labs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know it, uh, honestly i we had people showed up for it every week i was blown away um oh, but, yeah. but by the end of it i just really wanted to do build night again um it was eight weeks long and uh Oof. wow it was college level i i i used to teach cad at a local community college i taught that class at river yeah. city labs and at the end of it i taught them cam and uh then we went and cut a little project on the baby router that's sitting behind Aaron right now. And it was really fun. Um, and we had a really good time and I probably should do it again. I might do it again. I don't know. I've debated on that now that I've got some free time, but we need, we need more generic classes. People want to learn, but we lack the people with the time to teach it. And that's the problem. Man, this is this could be like a multi episode thing. Yeah, this is already a long episode, but it, yeah, we can always continue next week. We should try to get more makerspace organizers on, like get a couple different makerspace presidents to talk about this exact episode and how they've done it in their space. Not a bad idea. If you're yeah. if you're a makerspace organizer and you've made it this far through the episode and you would like to be on Makers on Tap. Uh, hit us up on makersontap at gmail.com makers on tap or r slash makers on tap on reddit me or Aaron or makers on tap on twitter or the bearded twitter tech is your best case yeah I check the email maybe at once or twice a week if I remember to do so so we are uh, the bearded tech right yep and Aaron makes yep and I'm not even going to try to say mine. Uh, it's Pure Silence yes. 13 with no vowels. <laughs> I didn't know that's what it was. Oh, that makes well, a lot more sense what, now. What was it? Pure Silence 13. It's my angsty Pierce teenager Silence, username. no vowels. Yep. Angst, angsty teenager username. Indeed, Pierce. the is strong. Pure Silence. P-R-C-D-S-L-N-C. Oh, fuck, that works. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, son. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> and Aaron has... Like, how, how, how do you do that? <laughs> and we know Aaron's gotten to the bottom of his crawler that his mind is blown by a username. <laughs> yeah. That's that's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Um, with that, keep making stuff. Oh, this yeah. is the end of the podcast. Must, 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 must.